Hi, my name is Ohad, and I'm a team lead at Riva. I worked on projects all across the software stack, mostly with Python, Rust, and TypeScript. Today, I want to tell you about how we solved a performance problem in one of our Python libraries using Rust. Rewriting stuff in Rust is a bit of a trope, but for a good reason. The safety and performance wins can be a game changer for almost any project. But rewrites are hard and risky, so today we'll explore an incremental approach that has two big benefits. The first is that we can start with very small changes, which is especially important if you or your team are new to Rust. The other benefit is that this will allow us to combine Python and Rust to achieve a good balance between flexibility and performance. So a bit of a background. Trigo is building autonomous supermarkets. We make it possible for retailers to provide a seamless checkout experience. All you need to do is go to a self-checkout machine and everything you took will be on the screen. You just tap your card and exit the store. One of the core parts of our solution is a 3D tracking system. This system uses an image from each of our cameras, which we have hundreds of in each store, and outputs a 3D skeleton for each shopper at every timestamp. Here you can see my 3D skeleton projected back into 2D in our little demo supermarket we have in the office. So how do we do that? The first step is to use a neural network on every image from every camera, which outputs the pixels containing heads, shoulders, and hands. Once this step is done, we want to move from pixels in 2D to 3D coordinates in the virtual space of the store. Our system is designed so that most of the computation happens for each timestamp in isolation. So we take all the 2D skeletons and group them by timestamp. Now that we have all the 2D skeletons from a single timestamp, we can build 3D skeletons for that timestamp by doing triangulation. The main point is that this allows us to mostly sidestep Python's inherent problems with parallelization and general slowness. We can do a ton of work per frame as long as we are willing to add cores as needed and accept a small constant delay. We started out with a pure Python code base, which uses NumPy for the majority of the mathematical heavy lifting. Researchers were able to iterate on this code base quickly and build an accurate system until we hit a major setback. As the number of physical concurrent users grew, this was back when COVID restrictions were slowly lifting, we started to run out of physical CPUs, which is one of the downsides of running an on-prem system. And so the system started to lag. We ran the numbers and we realized that we are going to need a very big performance improvement. And by big, I mean at least 50 times faster. We decided to go with an incremental approach. We profiled the system to find the biggest performance opportunities while trying to avoid frequently changing parts of the code base. We moved only those parts to Rust in very small steps, a single function or class at a time, while maintaining API compatibility. But how? How can you move a single function to Rust in a big Python code base? And how do you find the right function? We can use a toy library to demonstrate a few of the core ideas of how to do this. Our little toy library is going to have a very similar underlying performance problem. We are using Python, but a lot of interpreted languages like Ruby and JavaScript have the same issues. We'll dive into it a bit more in a minute, but the key points are that we have a Python class with NumPy attributes, and we work with collections of instances of this class. This means we are unable to utilize a lot of NumPy's faster operations, and we end up working directly with collections of objects in the interpreter. For us, this was because the result of a previous step, which was NumPy optimized, generated this shape of data. Again, this is a toy example. It's not doing anything useful, but it mimics our original performance problem quite well. To find the slowest part of the code, we are going to need a profiler. Python has a built-in profiler called cProfile, but in this case, it's not really the right tool for the job. First, it will introduce a lot of overhead to all the Python code and none for native code, so our results will be biased. We also won't be able to see into native frames, so we won't be able to see into our new Rust code. Instead, we are going to use PySpy, which is a sampling profiler that can see into native frames. It will introduce a similar and small overhead to both native and Python code. The other thing we are going to need is a benchmark. And good benchmarking is hard, but starting out, even a very simple benchmark can be super useful, like this script. It's not very scientific, but starting out, this is going to be more than enough. We use a script very similar to this one, and all it does is load an input, run it through the system a few times, and measure the average runtime. Running this script will give us our baseline. 
which for this particular example on my laptop is about 150 milliseconds. So let's find out what is so slow here. This is how running our code under the profiler looks like. And I should note that native code profiling is only supported on Linux. What we get back is a flame graph. Each box is a function on the stack, and we can see the relative time we spend in each function, including functions it calls to, which are stacked below it. The actual colors in the graph don't mean anything. Here, we see there's a function called find close polygons, which is taking the majority of the runtime. Even without reading the code, we can see that most of the time is spent doing norm, which is a numpy function. The actual flame graph is interactive, and we can click and see, for example, that the tiny blocks to the right are other Python functions from our module. Let's do as the profiler guides and check out find close polygons. This function does as its name suggests. It finds all the polygons closer than max dist to a given point. It iterates over the list, runs a simple operation on each element, and collects the results. This is both a hot loop running in the interpreter and a very suboptimal usage of NumPy. As this is a simplified example, there are quite a few ways to speed this up using NumPy tricks, but we are going to rewrite this function in Rust. We are going to do that using PyO3, which is the most popular library for interacting between Python and Rust. It is actually a project that spans a few libraries and tools. For example, Maturin is also a tool we are going to use, which manages the Rust and Python parts for us. They have exceptionally good documentation, and they have a detailed explanation about this type of setup. This is how an empty module looks like. It has quite a bit of mysterious incantations, but we can actually ignore most of them and just concentrate on our little function. Let's implement this function. So here we have our Python module, and this is find close polygons. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to copy this code and paste it directly into a Rust module and start fixing errors. So let's start by declaring a variables using the let keyword. Now in Rust, we also need to note if a variable is mutable, so we need to put mute here. And an empty list is declared using the vec macro. Now we need to replace semicolons with curlies, and we also need to end every statement with a semicolon. Now in Rust, we have explicit error handling. So we don't want to return this closed polygons object, we actually want to return a result. Um, so we need to wrap this in an OK, which means that this is the correct value returned from this function and not an error. We also don't have NumPy, so I'm going to delete this. And in Rust, append is actually push. So let's fix that. OK, so the last error is going to be a bit harder to fix. We don't have a center field for a Pyani object, and that's because Pyani is this generic everything goes type of object. What we need to do is we need to get this attribute using the Python interpreter. Um, and we can do that like so. Let's declare a new variable called center. And let's take poly and call a function called getOutter, which is just a getOutter function from Python. This function accepts pi, which is this reference to the gil and the name of the attribute, which is going to be center. Now, we also need to use question mark here, which says that if there's an error, it's going to be propagated back to the caller immediately. So if get error fail, for example, because there's no such attribute, it will just propagate the error back to the caller, and if not, we can continue executing normally. Now, let's replace this with just center and see what the next error is. So we can subtract any two Payani objects. And again, that makes sense because Payani is this generic everything goes type of object. What we want is the array behind that object. And the way to do that is by using extract. So let's redeclare variable and do center.extract. We again pass this pi object and again use a question mark. Now, what we are going to need to extract out of it is this pi read only array. And we need to tell extract to do that. And in Rust, we can do that by annotating the return type of a function. In this case, we can just say, this is going to be a pi read only array of floating points. And now extract knows what to extract out of this object. Again, it might err, it might return this error, this is not an array, um, and we'll go back to the caller. Now we can almost work with it. This is still a reference to something Python owns, and if we want a true native array, we need to call another function, which is called asArray. 
And we still have an error because we need to do the same thing for point. So let's copy this over, paste it again, and replace center with point. Okay, now still this is not happy with us. And that's because we cannot subtract array views. Because array might be big, we need to store the subtraction somewhere. And so one of the parts of the subtraction need to be owned. So let's do that. Let's, to own this, which is essentially a copy, we're going to copy this array. It's gonna cost us, but it's gonna be worth it. And so now center is this array, an owned array. So we can subtract those. Now, actually in ND array, the crate we are using, norm is defined as a function of an array. So we need to call dot norm like this. And seems like the compiler is happy with us. Let's make sure and go to the shell and Let's build this using Maturin. And this is going to build just fine. And let's start by measuring uh, the original Python implementation. Again, I didn't change anything. This should still be about 150 milliseconds on this machine. Great. Now let's go back to our Python module and let's edit it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call from polymatchRS and I'm going to import find close polygons. And now if we go back to the shell, we can measure this again. And if we let it run for a few seconds, it will let us know that we are about eight times faster than the original implementation just by doing this naive line-to-line -line translation. But we are not done yet. Running the profiler again, we now see our new Rust code. Let's zoom in. Here you can see the get other call, which is almost 30% of the entire runtime. I added the pink and blue colors to make everything more visible. We can summarize it like this. The pink part is basically overhead, allocating and deallocating objects, calling get other, and so on. The blue part is the actual logic of our function, calling norm and adding objects to the list. This means that the best way to improve performance even more is to rewrite the polygon class in Rust, which will let us eliminate all this overhead. What we actually want is to have quick access to the center attribute, and we also have to store x and y somewhere. But it would be a lot easier if we could ignore the other parts of the class, like the area function, at least for now. And remember, we are aiming for gradual improvement. Less work equals less risk and less time spent non-perf critical work. Our new struct is going to look like this, which is very similar to the original Python class. What we're going to do is only move the core functionality of Polygon to Rust. Then we will subclass from the Rust object in Python, and we will leave the rest of the code unchanged. Now, this will actually compile and run, but it won't be any faster. And the reason is that we need to use the fact that we now have a Rusty object wrapped in Python 1. Py03 has a very succinct way of expressing that. We just need to change the type of the parameter to be a vec of Python owned but rusty polygons. We're almost done. Remember, the original issue we had was that we needed to get out of the center attribute, which was a numpy array. Now we can directly reference the center attribute, and once we have it, we can directly calculate the norm with the rest of the code unchanged. And that's it. We can recompile, measure this again, which gives us another 10x improvement, which is super, super nice. So to summarize, we took a small toy library and we profiled it using PySpy. We then did a naive line-to-line -line translation of the hottest function, which already had a huge impact. Profiling again, we saw that converting a small part of our data structure to Rust could result in an even better performance. And indeed, we saw the overall performance improvement of almost 100x from our original baseline. I also have a blog post with even more info, along with a Gator repo with all the code and even more optimizations, so be sure to check those out. The key takeaways are that Rust with Py03 unlocks true native performance for almost any Python code, and that crafting fast building blocks for Python with Rust is an extremely powerful combination, which makes Python even better API for researchers. And that's it. Thank you.